I could drink that forever. How do I look? Opala. That's not good. So, we're off to tasting again. Should be really interesting. Here we go. This is the Chardonnay from Baden in Germany, specifically Kaiserstuhl, which is a mountain range in uh, Baden. It's kind of near, a little bit above Freiburg, which is a really beautiful city. I had a friend who studied there for a long time. I actually never went to visit him, but I've been there as a kid. I'm from more than the northern part of Germany, but I always liked the south. Uniquely, this is a Chardonnay coming from there. What's mainly produced there is Spätburgunder, Weißburgunder, and uh, Grauburgunder. And this estate specifically is known for those three. It's called Bercher. Uh, I think it's the 10th generation now or something involved in winemaking. So a lot of pride there. <laughs> this retails for right around $80 in the US. The wine is very delicate. It has a very delicate nose, very intriguing nose. I mean, typical notes of lemon, citrus fruits, but you get some sort of nuttiness that just explodes on the palate. That's intense. Chardonnay is an interesting grape. It's so versatile. It's quite neutral. It's not an aromatic grape variety. So compared to Riesling and Gewurztraminer and those kinds of grapes, you can do a lot with it because you can manipulate it with winemaking. So you can have very neutral, elegant, crisp, variety of, of Chardonnay. You can have the oak variety you can, and everything in between. That is a really good glass of wine. <laughs> Perfectly balanced. It has a nice crisp acidity, long finish, silky texture, um, medium full body. The oak is used perfectly. You get the brioche, toasty dough notes from the extended leaves aging and concentrated fruit character, apple, pear, lemon, acacia, floral notes. It just keeps going. You got some nuttiness. Oh man, what a start. I mean, this wine, I think, has the ability to age for a lot longer. It has the structure, the balance. It has all the components it needs to age a little longer. Just a great glass of wine, wow. All right, on to Alsace we go. We go over to the left a little bit, leaving Germany. Alsace is a very interesting region. The Vosges Mountains on the west protect the region from harsh weather. A lot of the vineyards are on southeasterly exposure on the foothills of those mountains. The vines basically have this, especially in the Grand Cru vineyards, which are usually in the middle of the slopes. They benefit from really long sunlight hours, so a very smooth ripening process, and then cool nights, which kind of retains that crisp acidity and slows that ripening back down. The mountains protect from harsh weather, so, you know, hail, rain can definitely be an issue over there, so. And like I said, a lot of the Grand Cru vineyards, which is this, this, these vines are coming from, are planted in the middle because you'll get enough competition and lack of nutrients that the vines have to compete with each other, which stresses them and strains them a little bit. You want them to be fighting to get to their nutrients. And if you have too much nutrient and water availability, which is the case on the plain, uh, you'll get uh, higher yields and kind of flabby wines. They're not stressed. A little bit of stress is good for vines. Uh, whereas at the top of the mountain, you don't want that either because then you get the wind and the, the lack of nutrients. So, you know, a lot of, in Burgundy and Alsace and these kinds of places, a lot of the best vineyard plots are sort of on the mid range. Uh, in Burgundy, it's funny because they're right next to the road. You're kind of driving and then all of a sudden there's, you know, Gevray Chambartin or something. This producer is called Buchel. Very German name, Buchel. They have, again, deep roots in Alsace. This is their 2012 Riesling, Clos Eugenie. It has such a lift to it. It smells of white peaches, guava, really interesting nose. You get a hint of the Riesling mineral oil, but it's quite uh, faint, actually. That is delicious. I love when a wine sort of makes you think and just kind of makes you reflect and take a second to sit with it. And this is doing that for me. It's very interesting, very complex. It's almost hard to pin down the notes that I'm getting. It's just almost, it reminds me of a place. Medium bodied, bone dry, great acidity, great length. Get a little bit of uh, definitely some honey, some wax, some candied elements coming in here. Could be from the age. A very fresh fruit, very concentrated fruit, not overly ripe fruit, which is just lovely. 
very structurally elegant and uh, precise. So this can age for <coughs> quite a bit more time, I think, similar to the Chardonnay, but this could probably go even more. Great glass of wine. I would definitely use this. $60 is the retail price. Again, these wines are a little bit in the mid-range, a little higher, but man, it's just, uh, I could drink that forever. Lovely little wine from Bandol, Domaine Buno, 2016 Moulin de Cost Rosé. So this is a blend of Sanso, Grenache, and Mourvedre. Mourvedre is a very thick-skinned grape that's hard to ripen. So it does well in very hot areas. Grenache is actually a thin-skinned grape and quite a light grape. So the combination, they mix very well. Very little area, plus it's just beautiful down there, right? I mean, lavender fields, baguettes, or what you want. Very interesting. <laughs> I say that about every wine I taste. To be fair, I'm tasting very good wines. I knew these were gonna be good going into them. So you're not gonna hear much uh, trash talking in this video. Really fresh. Bright cherries, some lemon verbena, some lemon zest. Very fresh nose, interesting. Get a little bit of tea, a little herbal quality coming through, herbal tea. I would class this as sort of an academic wine. I think this is very interesting. I don't think it's the most approachable glass of wine. That being said, it would do very well with people that are very into wine and that drink wine for the exploration of it, right? And the academic side and the interest and the intrigue. And then, yeah, people would love this. There's something a little medicinal about it. A little volatile acidity going on. Not overly so, it doesn't ruin the wine. I think it's an interesting wine. I would drink it. I just don't think it's all that approachable. Okay, so we've got, again, the estate from Baden in Germany, Beachia. Their Chardonnay uh, really surprised me just now when we tasted it together. This is a Spätburgunder from Beachia, which is the German way of saying Pinot Noir. It's a 375 milliliter bottle. Nice little, little bitty, bitty bottle. <laughs> Here we go. I have a little more energy right now, as you see. Um, work days slowly winding down. Get to taste some nice wines. Bercher Spätburgunder 2015. Erste Lage. Wow. 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 How many times have you heard me say that, huh? Very minerally nose. Something that, the term that is used more in white wine, much more, but good red wine also has that, a mineral tension. It's like, a, again, I said it in the last video, like licking, licking stone almost. Um, it's hard to describe minerality. It's a very, very overused term, but also one that has its place. So I use it. Um, very deep cherry, plum. I want to open this up. That's why if I'm doing this obsessively is to aerate the wine because I use this uh, Coravin, it's called, which is basically a little needle that goes through the cork and then allows me to extract some wine. Because I like to keep the, the bottles fresh. I take them to my colleagues to then retaste the ones that I approve. If I pull the cork, then I have to do it in 24 hours <laughs> or 48 or whatever. So this is a handy device that allows me to take my time, but it does keep the wines quite closed when they come out. So I like to aerate them and try to open them as much as possible with some oxygen. Yeah, quite pale actually, it has a nice sort of watery rim, a little bit of brown on the rim. This is closing in on eight years in bottle, I guess. Yeah, eight. You get the nice earthiness that you expect from good Pinot. I find this a little closed off right now, a little green. My hunch is it's a little reserved right now and I do want to open this up because I think there's it's gonna expand the more it's exposed to oxygen. It does have a great plum, earth, a little bit of mushroom, light body, nice acidity, high acids actually. Mouth still watering um, for those who would like to know. The more your mouth waters, the higher the acidity in wine. It's a handy little trick of the trade. I'm gonna come back to this. It's a nice wine. I think I need some air. All right, that's my verdict. Onward. Onward and upward, as I like to say. To the Southern Rhone we go. Cellier. Domaine des Trois Cellier. I love it. All right. Um, the Southern Rhone is a super exciting place. I mean, they it struggles a little bit with climate change. It gets really hot down there now. They will make use of 
interesting techniques. They'll use bush vines down there uh, to protect the grapes from intense sunshine. So the leaves will basically provide some shade to the grapes. And other, other techniques to weather the intense heat. So they can struggle with that. But that being said, again, it depends what kind of grapes you grow there. And something that does well is something like Mulvedre, which we just talked about. But thick skin, skin grape, small grape, very hard to ripen. And it needs that sunshine. It needs the intense heat to ripen. So that's where you'll get sort of all the GSM blends, Grenache, Syrah, and Mulvedre. Grenache, on the other hand, is a much lighter grape, thick, thin skin. So uh, that adds some body and then uh, Mulvedre can add the fruit concentration into the wine. And Syrah often brings in that peppery depth, I guess. There's some famous regions down there, Chateau Neuf de Pape, Gigondas. Cotiron is the sort of basic appellation and has an immense output, massive. So many wines are coming out of there. Uh, among those are some really great hidden gems and a lot of them. You'll find a great value down there. With people that know how to use the terroir, terroir don't do recipe winemaking, adapt to the vintage, and let the wine sort of do its thing. This is $28. Opa. This is a little bready, Bredenomyces, which is uh, for all you natural wine lovers, that funk that everyone talks about in natural wine. And some people love that bready sort of aspect, and technically it's a wine fault, but it does, it can add some nice elements. It's fading a little bit. The fruit is coming through with the air here with the oxygen. Again, you get the Syrah pepperiness, uh, very concentrated fruit, very ripe fruit. Higher alcohol, which you expect from down there, right? It's riper fruit, you get higher alcohol. And it's opening up nicely. It's very peppery, which is something I like as a style. And if you like big, big wines that with that peppery sort of um, depth to them, this is quite nice. More on the black fruit spectrum, uh, blackberry, black cherry, dark fruits, a little bit of licorice and eucalyptus, those kinds of things. A little green notes coming through too, herbaceous. You definitely get the garrigue, which is the lavender, thyme, rosemary combo, uh, all of which grow naturally in the vines down there along the vineyards. You'll get that sort of perfumed lift. Ah, uh, yeah, it's growing on me. I like this. It is, a, it is quite a nice glass of wine for the price. I would drink this, definitely. It's definitely, it's, it's definitely a food wine. I think this would go amazingly with, you know, beef stew, steaks. Thanks for watching and uh, see you next time.